Hey, it's Arrow. PodFest brings together three different conversations from musicians to authors, doctors, environmentalists, or cooks in their own kitchen. These are real people with real stories. PodFest 64, we kick things off with a true pawn star, Mr. Rick Harrison. Then we're going behind the scenes to spend some time with a real wizard, the voice of so many books on tape and audible, Robert Bathurst. Our third conversation is in memory of one of the most memorable comedians of our time, Richard Lewis. This is PodFest 64. Arrow, am I saying that right? You're absolutely saying it right, sir. How are you doing today? Fabulous. Living the dream. Absolutely you are. You're my Bob Dylan because I've been with you since episode number one. You have I've grown up around you and you've been a part of my family and lifestyle, but I still have to ask the question, why aren't people pawning more than they are selling? Because I was a guy in Montana that pawned everything. Well, we found out really quick when we first started filming the show that no one wants to be filmed when they're pawning their stuff. Okay. <laughs> That's simple, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's plain and simple like that, yeah. <laughs> well, what you guys are doing on Pawn Stars Do America, this to me, you're coming out to us, which is like, oh my God, we get to really see who you are. Um, Yeah, I, I'm I'm actually real and everything like that. You know, it, but it's really fun. I mean, because uh, I get to see a lot of stuff that would never come to Vegas. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, I, so I mean, like, and people are like lined up with stuff. So it's really, really cool. I mean, like 80% of it is like pretty bad, but, uh, the other 10 or 20% is really good. So, uh, it's been fun and, um, uh, you know, I'm sure I'm going to do it again, but like we just signed for, uh, a season of regular Pawn Stars in Vegas. So maybe, I think it maybe we'll be switching back and forth over the years, as long as they still have me. But apparently on the TV TV show that goes on forever. Was this inspired by your journey, to, you know, like going up into North Dakota and stuff? Because I thought that was one of my favorite times of, of watching you, the way that you went up there on the, on the cycle. I mean, you fell in love with that cycle. Well, I mean, no, I mean, like I've done that my whole life. I mean, like, uh, Unfortunately, I worked, I mean, I worked all summer long, but usually during the summer, I'll take one or two 1500 mile trips on my motorcycle. I still do that. Uh, and it's funny because I like just pull the woods and, you know, pull out my hammock and go to bed in the middle of the night. And, like people will pull up and like, you can't camp here. They go like, are you Rick from Pawn Stars? <laughs> 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 no, but I still do. I still do that. I, I, I there is nothing uh, like ride the motorcycle cross country i absolutely love it as you're going across the country have you noticed that the different regions are are hoarding things that in, in that that are different because here in the south man I'll, I'll sell you a washing machine i'll bring one over to you um <laughs> um different parts of the country have different stuff you know what i mean uh apparently everybody in kentucky has something amazing that's bourbon um and uh <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I filmed in Detroit, and I, it was just all car stuff. So, but yeah, it's regionally, it's a little bit different, but uh, you get, kind of get shocked on the weird stuff you see. When you went into Texas and you came face to face with that '68 Buick, oh my God, dude, you you like cars? Oh, I yeah, I have an addiction to cars. I mean, I, I there's you know, there's therapy for it, but I won't go. <laughs> uh, um, no, I mean, I mean, I have 29 registered vehicles. Uh, I just, uh, there, there is something about yeah, cars. I mean, um, you know, older, I mean, modern looking cars are, yeah, but like older car, I mean, they were literally, you know, the automakers, you know, fought over the best designers. And then you, you take a designer and then you had to have engineers. It's the mechanics, it's the engineering, it's the style and everything that wrapped up into a beautiful piece of art that you could drive. That and guitars. Um, I can't drive a guitar. I got <laughs> chubby. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've tried to learn how to play a guitar. It's just never going to happen to me, so I'm going to stick to the cars. <laughs> how do you put up with someone like Chumley? Because, I mean, Chumley seems to be that one little co-worker that we all have. We just kind of give them the look, and then you, you try to straighten them out, but they, they, it's just not going to go right. Uh, I, you know, I mean, uh, he's been my burden for, like, 30 years, so uh, I love him to death. Uh, I treat him like a son, and, like, um, I don't know. I just, I like 30 years ago, I just sort of got, he just got stuck on me, like yeah. something on my shoe and like couldn't get it off. And like, uh, like I said, I love him to death. And, uh, he, he's the funniest person. He's one of the funniest people on television. I mean, like the stuff that comes out of his mouth is just shockingly funny sometimes.
You just never see it coming. I, I just watched one of the rewinds because it, Pawn Starts is everywhere anymore. And you can go all the way back to the beginning seasons. I saw the one that, that where he was you know trying to buy paintings. And then you taught him how you know what to look for and stuff. And then you put him through a test. I love that kind of stuff about you, Rick, because that shows leadership. Well, I mean, the other thing about my show is, I mean, like, uh, I, you know, and I'm real proud of it. I mean, a bunch of, you know, uh, I meet parents all the time. They tell me about how it's the only show they can one of the few shows they can watch with their kids. And uh, you actually learn something on my show. Um, and I've always said, like, you know, it's like laugh and learn TV. I kind of invented it. You know what I mean? And uh, uh, that's one of the reasons why I love it so much. I mean, like, uh, it's one of the last family shows left on television. I'm a show prep freak. I don't know how you can just pull this stuff out of, out of your mind when it comes a book comes in and all of a sudden you're giving me a history lesson. And the thing is, in school, I would have I would have tuned out. But when you're talking, I don't tune out. Uh, well, you know, the reason I know all this stuff is because I know nothing about popular culture. I mean, <laughs> literally, you said Kim, Kim Kardashian right next to me, and I have no idea who it was. Uh, I, you know, I listen to old music and I uh, uh, read books every night. I don't, you know kind of a bad thing to say for a guy who's been on television for so long, but I don't watch television. I just read at night and I just read bizarro weird statement. I, I read books on material sciences. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's kind of nerdy, but I do it. Yeah. But yeah, but that's what we love about you. You are a nerd because you're in that, you're in that pawn <laughs> store and it's, it's like, Oh my God, this yeah. guy is, is with everybody. And I think that's one of the things I learned during the pandemic is that no matter what was going on in the world, I had pawn stars and you guys were always with people <laughs> having conversations. Um, yeah, and it's also the way we filmed the show. I mean, we filmed the show so we could turn it in at any time and just start watching it. It's comfort television. And like I said, it's one of the last family shows on television. Yeah. So the, the gold and silver pawn shop, everybody that's been in my neighborhood has been there and in Vegas. It's such a mile marker right now. And I mean, that's got to be fascinating for you. Did you think it was going to grow that big? Um, no, 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 I'm no. Literally, for back of, lack of a better term, I was like a media whore, and every time I got like national <laughs> press, it was good for business. So I was, like, you know, hey, if I get this, if I get this, uh, like a reality show, I get a season or two, it'll be good for business. I never thought it'd be on in 150 countries, 38 languages. I mean, I averaged two thousand two thousand people a day in the pawn shop. Yep. I mean, it's the number one non-gaming tourist attraction in Las Vegas. Wow, wow. You're heading into, on, on the Pawn Stars Do America, I mean, you've Tampa, Boston, Detroit, Phoenix. I mean, you're going to some real hot spots in America. Uh, yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I think I'm doing um, 160 nights in hotels this year. God. <laughs> <laughs> Those moments where you you kind of just uh, when some when you can't make a deal, I think is one of the greatest examples of the pregnant pause because a lot of people don't believe in that. But when you're making that deal and you give us as viewers that pause, oh my god, that is so intense. <laughs> I don't mean just part of my job. It's just what I did my whole life. I mean, but you know, I mean, it's like if the deal's right, the deal's right. If the deal's not right, the deal's not right. And I just walk away and. Uh, you know, that's another thing I've always taught about my show. I mean, I talk about my show. I mean, this is how business works. I mean, this is reality. I mean, it's, uh, we can't make it, you know, maybe so. I mean, I love it all the time. Well, someone offer, else offered me that. I'm well, like, well, go take it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so where along the line did Big Hoss drop Big Hoss? Because, I mean, you, you go back to the beginning episodes and that's, that's all, that's how we knew him. Um, yeah, I know. Uh, he got the lap band surgery and uh, started working out a lot and uh, got skinny all of a sudden. Yeah. And he's going to bring another boat to you because he likes buying boats. Oh, uh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, boats are a giant hole in the water you throw money into. <laughs> Dude, you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. All right. Thanks for having me, Ben. Well, you be brilliant today, okay? Thank you. All right. Same to you. Hello and good morning. How are you doing today, Robert? Oh, hello, Robert. Hello. Man, congratulations on getting the opportunity to create and be with Louise Penny again. Because, I mean, the, the way the two of you, you, you are Lennon and McCartney together. <laughs> I said to you, delighted to hear that. Lennon and Ringo Starr, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is is it like sitting down with an old friend when you have her books in front of you? Because I mean, the the connection that you guys have had is just has just been mind blowing. Yeah, it's a connection. It's I'm very well aware of the hierarchy in all this because I mean, she writes it, and I don't suspect she listens to it. We 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 talk. We we we, we communicate quite a lot. 
and uh, I see her whenever I can. Um, but uh, the, the, the relationship between an author and the audio reader is, uh, there's no, you know, you, 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 it's her creation, and she's got the, the, the voices in her head as to how these characters are. So um, I wouldn't want uh, her to listen to what I do, because, uh, you know, it's, 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 her, it's, it's what's, you know, what's going on in her head that's the most important thing, what she gets down on the page. But it's really exciting every year. To, to read it and to have that sort of sense that here we go again and uh, will this one work again? It's in the seventeenth of the uh, of the series. I've read the last seven of them. Wow. Uh, sadly, Ralph Cosham died the, the first reader. He died after having read ten of them. But um, I've done the last seven, and uh, it's been a been a big good ride. Well, the way that you bring out the words is that, see, I grew up listening to Radio Mystery Theater, and I was always intrigued by the way that I was drawn into the story. You do the same exact thing, and that's why I can't peel myself away from this, because I'm, I'm so much into the story with you. Well, I'm delighted to hear that, because it is about engagement, isn't it? It is about drawing, people, drawing you in and not pinning you back, because I think, I think you know, if you're just you're trying to pin someone back with the voice beautiful and, and all the sort of histrionics and technique, and, and that I think that can get, get wearisome after a while. So you are, as the reader, just the conduit between the author and the listener. And, and, and just don't get in the way. You know, just, of course, serve the writing. Of course, squeeze the language as, as best you can. Of course, get, get, make the characters as, as pronounced as you can. But uh, don't intrude and don't, uh, don't, don't get in the way of what the author intended. Yeah. Of course, you know, find the nuances, but... Uh, no, don't, don't, don't be annoying. <laughs> well, Louise <laughs> definitely has of, of, of a marriage. Louise definitely has her eye on on what's going on in the world today because I mean th this story is very timeless. I mean the cost of giving a voice, a, a, you know, a, a, to to a public figure. I mean she, she, this is something that it's it's almost like it came out of today's newspapers. Yeah, I mean she's she's taken this. The start of the book is set slightly in the future when we're no longer in the grip of of anxiety and fear and uh, in, 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 uh, about the, uh, the virus. And, but it's also acknowledging the fact that uh, although we've all collectively, everybody collectively has, has been under the cost of this thing, um, people's reactions have been very different and, and, and the way they've expressed their differences um, hasn't been, um, you can call it debate, it's just been a sort of a, 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 a harangue, a sort of overlapping harangues. And it's been tribal, and it's been um, really, really uh, bitter, and it's left people really unsettled. And and so that is the atmosphere in which we embark on the Madness of Crowds, the um, the new novel. Um, and Inspector Gamache has to um, is detailed to protect someone whose opinions he finds abhorrent. And so he has this, this personal and professional tension uh, that he's got to um, master. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to do his job properly, but also um, uh, you know, I acknowledge the fact that he's uh, he, he doesn't doesn't agree with them. But uh, of course, things develop uh, beyond that. But it's that's that's the atmosphere in which this uh, this where we kick off with this book. Well, I, I love where she puts it in Three Pines, which is that's a Canadian village, is it not? Because I'm from Montana, and Canada was just right there as my neighbor. Yes. Um, yeah, and it, uh, Three Pines doesn't exist. And in, in the early novels, it's established that Three Pines is not on any uh, okay. GPS. Okay. Uh, and, and, and Three Pines, sorry, Three Pines is a sort of, in, in one sense, is a sort of state of mind. Okay. And and it's a sanctuary. It's a place of it's a place of healing. But for a place of healing, there's a lot of murder going on there. I tell you, and it's sort of it, it, he, he he people go there who are who are to some extent people who live there. They're all to some extent lost. And, but they are lost in a way which everybody's lost. I mean, everybody has lost, and, and everybody has things that they yearn for and aspire to and hope, hope for. And, 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 and it's, there is a sort of strange mystical quality. I would, I would call it with a small s spiritual as well, in, yeah. in, in the sense that there is underlying the, the, the murder and mayhem. There is underlying it a sense of enormous, great goodness. It, it is... It is really a manifesto to say that goodness does exist in the face of every, everything that comes out to, to the country of that. And there is, um, underlying it, uh, a, a really w strange and perhaps unfashionably expressed feeling of, of uh, the possibility of redemption. How do you study for, for, for a book like this? Because, I mean, do you, I mean the, the scripts I know probably arrive, but the thing is, though, is that you still, as an actor, have got to become a part of the story somehow, some way, do you not? 
it never part of the story. I mean, you know, it's always, always, always the golden thread is between the author and the audience. Yeah. How to engage the audience in a way which which the author intended, but uh, needs to be um, needs to be needs to be achieved. Um, so yeah, you you embody it in the sense that like a performance, it's a performance, you know, it, and it's not just a reading. I mean, of course, uh, at a basic level, you've just got to read it and make sense of it. But then you've then you've got to squeeze every phrase and and find the characterization of of all the different character of all the different characters and and also take from the way that it's written the the cadence of it of writing the, the the length of the sentences how quite how how pacey it should be or how languorous it should be or, or whatever and, and take take your cue from from what she's written um, so yeah there's all sorts of things that the the narrator can do to to um, to colour it in. But uh, there's a lot you can do to to, to, um, to disengage the audience. So your job is to is to completely engage them with what she's what's what she's presenting. Uh, but and obviously another reader would do it in a, in a different way. But you just so the only sort of personal aspect to it is you bring it you bring your take on it. But that should never get in the way of what the author intended. So many authors have uh, explained to me that the reason why they became authors and writers was because they were fans of reading. Now, you bringing books to life, does that make you an extension to that of that, that, that celebration of reading and having a passion for it? I have a celebration of language, and, and, uh, and my job is always uh, at root about language. I always get very concerned when you're doing a play, and on the first day of rehearsal, uh, the the director says, "Okay, well, this is the movement director. You think if we get the movement director in now, we just sort of make sense of it first. Because just just you find, you know, you'd understand this as a, as a as a as a radio expert. You know, you, you it's it's all it's all about the language ultimately. Yep. Yep. Okay, fine. You can you can dress it up in all sorts of production and 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 and, and all that. And my my least favourite um, phrase when a, when a TV, dra- TV producer comes up to me when I'm doing a, a, a filming." And they say it's going to look second to none. You think, oh, that's how it's going to look. You just want to know how it's going to sound, how it's going to engage. And uh, when they say that, you think the production values of this are going to swamp any form of any, any of the drama. And another pet peeve is is when when people say, just go do your magic. This is not a magic trick. You know, you you got to give me direction somehow, <laughs> some way. Yes. Um, yeah. Exactly. I mean, if if it becomes all about the technique. Then it's going to be um, redundant. You know, you're not, going, you're not you're not going to engage. It's 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 all it's all about the the, the voice beautiful or about sort of whatever it is that um, you can bring to it. You know, it's it's got to live and it's got to breathe. Um, so somehow, whatever that magic magic is, <laughs> you want the director who 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 can direct. I mean, I've I you know I had some rubbish directors in time. This uh, for the the director of this audiobook is Lorelai King, who's a, a established and award winning voice artist in her own right. And also a very, very good director, and uh, so I love, I love the conversations we have, and I love the interventions she makes during a recording, and it's uh, very much a sort of uh, a partnership between the two of us. With the popularity of podcasting and things like this, do you not see that stories like that like you have here with the madness of crowds will continue? I mean, it's already huge, you know, books on tape and stuff like that. That's been around forever, but to do what you do, because you you put such an elegance to the sound of the story, and and it raises the bar of quality. I, that it, it's it's amazing what you what you what you do with your stories. Uh, well, you have to you have to have a simple approach. I mean, in order to in order to get it across. Um, I'm delighted you feel that, and I'm, I'm very, very um, heartened by that, and and uh, and, and thank you. Um, but it, it is um, you have to detach to some extent from yourself, and and just and to and to read it and imagine it. And if you, if you have a vivid imagination, any reader has a vivid imagination because they can they can see it. But also uh, the way she writes, you can also smell it, you can also taste it. She writes in a very sensual way, and and uh, you you want to. Give the, the 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 listener the same sort of level of experience that the that the that the reader would have from from the print version, and uh, so you you just have, all the time you have the you have the audience in mind and 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 you if you imagine the characters I can see them when I'm doing them and 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 how they're set and how they how they are 
um, then uh, I, you just hope that the that the audience are going to get engaged in, in, that, in, in the way they should. Well, in that engagement, as as a listener, there, and I'll tell you how it affects me. I can't. I, I'm listening to it, but I can't run back to a real world until I've had at least five or ten minutes to kind of put myself back in the real world because you take me to a different, completely different place, and I've I've got to kind of regrip life, and that's that's what this story does. Uh, the the madness of of a, of a crowd because because you you take me there. And it's just the most amazing feeling when you have to struggle to get back. Thank you, Larry. Yes, well, and I'm, I'm, I'm delighted you feel that way. And I've, yes, well, I've been listening to audio books that work in that way. I remember uh, finishing a book, and uh, I was going for a country walk, and uh, I bumped into somebody I knew. But uh, and he thought I <laughs> thought I'd gone strange because I'd literally got to the end of the chapter, and my 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 sort of eyes were just. Just yes. revolting, and uh, I was completely in the in the in in the world that I just uh, emerged from, and it took a, lot, a certain amount of decompression <laughs> for me to sort of come around. So yes, yeah, so when that happens, it's uh, yeah, it's great, and that's when audiobooks uh, are at their best. You you talk about that decompression. I I, I swear to you that I, I I keep what's called a defrag journal that I will I pick up my my journal and I write about what I just listened to so that I can so I can document the experience so that when someone says well what is this book about let me tell you what this book is about and what it what it what it's about is what I'm feeling in this moment. Yes, if you can, if you can have a sort of spiritual reaction a gut reaction to yeah. it, uh, then that then that that's fantastic. I mean, absolutely, and it's everything that the author would have intended and and everything that the uh, audio reader would hope. Now, do you yourself sit down with a writing instrument and bring out words? Because I mean, you, you to understand a story, you've got to live the life, right? I you, you don't well, you don't have to have experienced the life, um, but uh, you certainly have to have an empathetic attachment yeah. to it. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I, yes, I don't think. Um, well, that's what I love about acting is 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 that you can you can you can imagine you are. In there, you don't. It doesn't have to have been something that you've you've had a lived experience of in order to get it across. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 living the life is one thing, but uh, being able to trans, transmit it and get it across, especially if there are five people in the room who all have different opinions, and you've got to you've got to get each one of those across. <laughs> That's when it gets a bit, uh, bit, bit more complicated. Well, I, I love how you've given yourself permission to be in so many different places with your acting abilities because, I mean, you are definitely somebody that, that inspires the next generation to grow forward. I, I mean, it's, uh, that's, uh, you, want to, you, want to, you want to engage the audience, first of all, and uh, not make it about you yeah. and, uh, and to, and to, and to you know, get, 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 the, get the author across and... and land it with them, and then you know, get their imagination engaged. Jerry Lewis once said to me, he says, when you're on that stage, that live stage, you have to reach the person in the final row, up there in the nosebleed section. And yet when you're in television, the microphones are so powerful that you, you, you could whisper and the world can still hear you. When you're putting a book together, what, 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 is, what is your audience? I mean, how do you, how do you envision that, that person that's going to pick up your vocal, your vocal range? I don't see any difference, oddly enough, between theatre, whether you're um, trying to get give row A the same benefit as row Z, um, and uh, and an audio book or a radio show or a TV show. It is it, all about engaging the audience that are there. There's yeah. no point in 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 mumbling. Uh, I'm not mumbling. No point in mumbling any, any at any stage. But there's no point in in doing a voiceover um, treatment for, on stage. Of course, they're not going to hear it, but but it, it, you work out where the audience is. You never shout, but just just use your technique to to, to reach them. Same with the uh, when you're doing radio or audiobooks, yeah, the, the the audience are possibly only about six inches from your mouth, and mm -hmm. and so you you they're there. But it's exactly the same juices are flowing in terms of the storytelling, in terms of of landing the language and squeezing the language and and finding finding how to engage them. You sort of imagine them, but you also um, it, it's best to imagine the characters and yeah. and to have a have a technical facility to to uh, to, to to work with the microphone or um, on the, the TV camera, but um, but not essentially be any different because essentially you're just you're just doing language which needs to communicate. That's so interesting you say that because even when I do my my uh, NASCAR commercials where you have to use your voice, um, the the, the director is still saying <laughs> share your story. You you can grunt and grind all you want, but share the story. They're not going to listen to you if you don't share the story. 
Absolutely. Well directed. Hang on, it's great. One of the great directions, that, to share the story. Yes. And uh, just sharing the story. And I love the fact that you're sharing the story of Nazca. That's great. Yeah. And so, you know, <laughs> you get to Rosé Z doing that voiceover, I tell you. <laughs> Please come back to this show anytime in the future, Robert. The door is always going to be open for you. Thanks, Aaron. Very good to talk to you. Will you be brilliant today, okay, sir? Thanks very much. And you. It's really good to talk to you. Thank you. <laughs> We're unplugged and totally uncut with Richard Lewis. I literally get that. I am more than just a Jewish comic. If anyone is sicker than me, I'll get out. And, and I, I do that. I do that. And if anyone is really in trouble, I, I'm out and I fled. You know? You now you take all the money. You know, just, I mean, I'm not rooting for a death to happen on a course. Hello, happy people. What's this crap about happy people? <laughs> yeah, listen to you. <laughs> Aren't we How awesome? How dare you? <laughs> you know, that's what, I've, uh, that's what I've always loved about you, is that you're going to stand up and say, you know... How does my... Can you hear my unhappiness come through clear? <laughs> you hear me pretty Dude, well? I, I can hear you perfectly, but you know, you got to be happy. Look at that head of hair you still have. Uh, I, I, my wife paints it before I leave the house. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> you know, it's a the camera comes in close, you can just see her, even her... Uh, are we on the air, by the way? We are on the air. How have you been? Well, then I don't. I like to save it for your audience. You know, you're too arrogant. <laughs> oh, no? my God. <laughs> uh, it's great to be here. You know why I'm here? You know, you have a, I have a, a gold mine of neurosis in a box that bundles of nerves coming out next on the 2nd of September, which I've tried to put together for about 10, 12 years. And I finally, people can finally understand why I've been so screwed up and stopped thinking it's a fraud. But you, I am screwed up. But you know what's I'm, so... I'm grateful to be screwed up and alive. How's that? Does that make sense? It absolutely does, because millions of people were following you before the internet was even created, and today this next generation is going to look at your DVDs and say, now this is what funny really is. Well, you know, thank you, but, uh, you know, this is really, a, uh, this really chronicles, you know, I, I, it chronicles all of the stuff that was important to me, you know, finding an identity on stage, which was clearly just taking a shower and going on stage, and that was it, it was just talking about the shower and how I felt. And, uh, and Diary of a Young Comic uh, was a special that preempted Saturday Night Live back in the you know, when early heyday. So that was, it's, and it talks about how to become authentic as a performer and uh, how you find your voice no matter what you are in the arts. And uh, that was a cool project and really trippy that it preempted SNL in the time slot. And then, uh, I, you know, I'm a recovered drug, you may not know, but I'm a recovering drug addict and sex addict and alcoholic and, um, you know, there's a couple of projects. One, I play a junkie in a real cult indie movie, Drunks, with an amazing cast. I don't know how I even got the role. And, um, and, it's, and, and then I played uh, the bottom line in New York, which is no longer there, about six months sober. So that was, an, and it turned out to be a cool night, this, the show. But, I mean, the fact that I did this movie and this concert sober was really freaking me out. But the fact that I pulled it off gave me a lot of uh, confidence. And uh, ultimately, I decided to put in a, a documentary of my, my former house, which everyone in Hollywood called the museum who knew it. And it was an homage to all the arts, you know, whether it was Marilyn Monroe or you, you know what I mean? I had pictures and photographs of everything. And because uh, that was my children, really. I know it sounds stupid, but, you know, I just love looking up and seeing the Stones or the Beatles or, you know, Miles Davis and photographs and Chaplin and Keaton. So that's how I lived for about 25 years. And, uh, and we're getting we're out now. But uh, I, at least my wife wanted to make sure it was a documentary. So it's a pretty cool little film. Your, your performances have always been about life and its endless cycles. How is it through everything that you've been through that you keep getting back on that bike? It is endless cycles. It is a day, pardon me, a day at a time for to know what's going to happen. You just don't know second to second. And it took me a long time to figure that out. And sure, I'm anxious about it, but uh, there's nothing I can do about it. That's what life is. You know, you could be in a, you know, in a crap storm any second, and you can also have a great run, you know, for weeks and weeks on end. So I just try to accept the bad now better. And I really used to freak out over the bad stuff. But, but fine, fortune. Oh, did you hear that scream? I love that. It's a scream pillow from Edward Monk. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, my wife bought it for me. She said, "Why? Just stop screaming. Let the pillow do it for you." She wanted to save my energy when I got a little older. Um, that made any sense to you? No, I just want to just you know I just accept stuff, man. And but I luckily can make jokes out of my misery. I do. Yeah, I'm talking about myself. It's pathetic, but I mean that's what I do. I've done it since I'm 21. So do you find yourself and in person? Makes me feel better when I go on stage. Hey, man, you know. That's you, where it's at. So, luckily, I have some really cool shows that I've done as a young comic, you know, and stuff all the way up to me now. Because in the documentary, I narrate it. So, I moderate it, rather. So, I hope you enjoy it, man. I really do. I mean, I put a lot of work into this for about, uh, so did the producer. And um, so, I, I just hope that... Uh, you dig it and your fans dig it. Well, what's what's so fascinating about it is is that it, it is your legacy. It is your story. It's almost like you're saying, look, this is how it's done. I got through the mess and so can you. It's almost like you're going to become a motivational comedian. Uh, could you get a couple of people to come? They'll split it. <laughs> I, 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 why don't we rent like, a, you know, like a big arena and have 12 people staring at us and then you'll owe me $150,000 and it'll be great. <laughs> And then we can make a movie out of it, me chasing you for the bread to Mexico. But that's just a thought now. It's, just, it's, in, it's in its early uh, beginnings, the movie. I, yeah, I would be like a, yeah, I'll, I'll take you at your word. And yeah, I am a motivational speaker now. I actually go on and do that. And people start chuckling when I talk about it. And then when I get into the hell I've been through and then I survive, particularly with drugs, uh, you know, they go, hey, maybe the guy's for real. Of course I am, you know. Uh, it, it, I take great pride in the fact that I shouldn't be here, to be honest with you. And uh, so I don't really, I, I am i am nuts, but I, I'm grateful. I'm a grateful nutcase. Well, I'm glad that you've done this DVD because you're proving to the world that you still have strength and that through comedy with its low end after 2008, you're here, you're here to stay, and I'll wa- and watch the face of comedy change because you are back. You're a trip, man. Thanks very much.